best to use, a, there are lots of ways that you can do it, but the easiest way and most straightforward way that you can do it is a scanner. Uh, and when you create a scanner, you create a new file you, uh, by using new file, and then you provide the, uh, the qualified path uh, to, of the file that you want to open. Right now, that scanner is going to be scanning the file, right? It starts at the top of the file and then reads through the file until, you, until it's, uh, until it's uh, at the end of the file. Don't worry about the try catch. We'll cover that momentarily. Uh, but this example uh, showed how to read a file line by line uh, and then process each one of those lines uh, doing whatever you needed to do. Uh, the, the check to see if you're at the end of the file or not uh, is has next, right? While the scanner still has another token or another thing to read, then it will continue. Well, uh, when, it, when it reaches the end of the file, it no longer has anything to read, so it returns false and you break out of this while loop. So while it still has something to read, we'll go ahead and call next line, right? If you wanted to do different things, uh, let me go ahead and go over here. Where, where's my cursor? There we go. Uh, we, you could do like s dot next int, right? If you if you knew that the next thing that was going to be in the file was an integer, you could uh, you could just go ahead and get the next integer and store it off. The problem is when let's take a, uh, a look at what was in that file. Is the first thing in that file an integer? Nope. So what's going to happen when we try to read it as an integer? Right. It's going to come up with an input mismatch exception. And that, uh, that way we can determine, oh, OK, well, this file is corrupted, or this file doesn't conform to, the, uh, to what we expected. Right? Uh, so let me go ahead and get rid of that. Actually, I'll just comment it out so that you have it on your uh, notes. Uh, but otherwise, uh, what I was trying to do was uh, just get, get each line and then print it out and do, or do something with it. Uh, so for example, uh, dot next line. That gets the entire line. And uh, I forget whether or not it preserves that end line character. Let's test it out. Right? Uh, let's go ahead and get rid of this stuff here and just print the line. Uh, and he, again, here's the contents of the file. Uh, the first line, uh, and this is no longer the first line, but the first line is a bunch of CSV data, then the second line. So it has six lines total. If I just run this and print out the line, right, it prints out the file contents uh, word, uh, byte for byte, basically. Now, did it preserve the end line characters or not? Did it chomp them out and get rid of them? Well, it looks like well, they, they didn't. Uh, or, uh, they, 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 oh, sorry, excuse me, that they did because. Let me go back over here. Where's my cursor? Hard to see. What, how are we printing them? We're printing them on the next line. If I didn't do that, if I just printed them as they were, now they're all going to be on the same line because it cakes out those online characters for me. Right? And now every single line is, is printed one after the other. This was, uh, the, the print ln was re responsible for restoring those endline characters back in. Okay? Uh, I'll go ahead and leave that as is. And maybe get rid of this. There we go. All right, uh, but otherwise, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, process CSV data, say, in your, like your homework, right? Uh, then you can. Uh, this is also CSV data. Neat, right? Then what I showed you at the end was you can get the line, and then you can tokenize it. Remember, if you're coming from a C background, you remember how we did tokenization. Toke. That stood for string tokenization. Here, it's not called tokenization, but I'm going to call the result tokens. Uh, the result is simply uh, you, 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 uh, the, the line that you just read, you split it. And that's basically its tokenization. You can split it along any delimiter. You can split it along uh, a, um, an O instead. What was the content there? I do have some O's there, so let's see uh, what it looks like. And uh, let me go ahead and restore this so that we can actually see it. All right, there we go. This is CSV data, and then that O, that's where it got tokenized. If you want to tokenize on S's instead, right, then you can do that. And it'll tokenize it and split it up. This is, uh, you know, the S's are now gone. The delimiters are gone. They're chomped out. And then it's been split up. It's been cut up uh, along those delimiters. You can actually do full regular expression support. So instead of CSV data, let's go ahead and put in, I don't know, uh, let's go ahead and replace all commas with spaces. Replace all of those. Now this is no longer CSV data, right? This is just space data, right? Uh, so we could, you could do something like this. Uh, that go ahead and split along all the spaces, and you get this is CSV data. Wow, right? Uh, but if you've got multiple spaces in there, say I've got space, space, space. I've got maybe 
uh, I, uh, now you can't see it, but I'm going to tab over. There's a tab and then a space. Uh, and then, uh, well, I can't do an end line character because that would take me down to the next line, uh, but I could put in, you know, five spaces instead. Let's see how this works now with just a regular old space, right? Different, right? In fact, I've got many uh, empty tokens here because it had, if you have five spaces, when you split it up like that, you're going to have multiple tokens on that. But that's not what I want. I want to split up on any and all white space. So you can put in what are called regular expressions. And unfortunately, off the top of my head, I might have to do a Google search here. I think it's going to be uh, B for white space. Uh, one, or, one or more. And let's see if this, this, I'm crossing my fingers that this works off the top of my head. Uh, this is CSV data. Uh, nope. All right. So is it S? Thank you. Oh, and then in, unfortunately, I'm going to have to do a backslash if it's that way. And there we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So slash S. I had to put in double slash because if you want a slash, then how do you escape that? You need a double backslash. S is, uh, slash S is the regular expression, at least in Java. There, there are variations out there. I think slash B is may, maybe in some, uh, like uh, Perl, Perl compatible regular expressions, I forget. Sometimes it's slash W I've seen in other, uh, other systems. But it's a regular expression that matches patterns. Right? What this pattern matches is any white space character, and then the plus says one or more. So if you've got one white space character, two white space characters, three white space characters, or 50 white space characters, that's going to be your delimiter. So it doesn't matter if you've got one space, or 10 spaces, or a tab and three spaces. It's going to match all of those as your delimiter. They are very, very powerful, and I suggest that you start to, to, to take a look at them a little bit closer and deeper. Uh, you might be taking 251 right now, CSCE 251, which is an online Unix course. Uh, at some point, you will get into regular expressions there from the command line and, and tools like grep. Uh, we, we, we won't get into it too deeply here, but it's an extremely powerful tool to use. Because now you can write regular expressions to match, say, complex patterns like uh, uh, URLs or, or, or phone numbers or things like that. And you can pull, automatically pull out phone numbers from a huge document with just a, a small regular expression and let it do the work for you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not going to compile because it's slash, a, a slash s is not a, uh, an escape character. Uh, but slash, slash, uh, slash or backslash is. Right? And so uh, basically, I'm j uh, this, this is the true regular expression right here. But to get it, I have to escape the backslash. Now, if you've got multiple, I've seen it multiple levels of where you have to escape it up here, and then you have to escape it down here. I've seen you need, well, you need one backslash at the end. Well, then you need two on this level, and then thus four on this level. And so it can get really, really uh, confusing really, really quickly. Uh, but the last thing I want to draw your attention to here is if I had just printed out tokens, tokens, I would have gotten something that looks like this. Right? It's just going to uh, it's just going to be a an array of strings, and it doesn't know how to print that out by default. Instead, what it's printing out here is the Java Virtual Machine memory address of that thing that you wanted to print. Uh, there is, we'll get into this when we get into objects, but basically, if you want a convenient way of printing things, you need to override and use the to string method. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call another method in the arrays library. So there's java.utils.arrays. And they've got a bunch of static methods in there that are, that, that, that are helper methods that allow you to do deep copies or, or, or do a bunch of different things, right? Uh, to, do, to find out what, what it offers, you need to RTM, read the documentation. Uh, and this one just provides a two string method. That if you give me, uh, th this is the function now, if you give me uh, any uh, array, I will go ahead and nicely format it for you with square brackets on either end and commas between each one of those things. And so this is how I'm getting this nice pretty printing out of this thing. And it is called pretty printing. <laughs> uh, it, in, your, in your second homework, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll use a library, hopefully, to do pretty printing. Right? Uh, it just means that you printed it out uh, so that it looks nice. I'll go ahead and cut and paste this so that you have it in the notes. Uh, the other analog, though, is that you need to do file output sometimes. Uh, now, you've already seen uh, the standard output, uh, system.out.print, or println, or printf. Uh, there are lots of ways of doing file output. I'm only going to show you one, and it's the easiest and most convenient way. 
Uh, and that's going to be to uh, use a print writer. Let me go ahead and go over here. Uh, let's go ahead and get rid of all this and start anew. So for the first thing I need to do is, is create a print writer. Print writer. P and I'll call it PW for lack of a better name. And I'll go, go ahead and create a new print writer. And I need to tell it, well, what file are you printing to? Right? It's not printing to a physical printer. It's printing to, uh, you can think of it like that. Uh, the, the file is your, uh, is, is your, your print device. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and, and tell it that I want a new file in, say, data slash I don't know, output or my output.txt. And by the way, well, as I'm doing this, uh, I'm only focusing on, um, on, on textual input and textual output, text-based uh, files. If you want to get into binary files, by all means, go ahead and, uh, and check those out. Uh, but if you're in a programming language like, uh, like Java, higher level, if you want to manipulate images or uh, audio files or something like that, there are things built into the language that allow you to do that. Right? There's a, I think it's java.io.image. It opens up any image, any format, and it'll take care of that stuff for you. So don't think that you have to work at the low level of binary data, right? Uh, like you might have to if you don't have a library in, say, C. Uh, but we've got a print writer here. I need to import it. I think it's in java.io. Where is it? Yep, java.io. It's now been imported. If I expand this out up here. Uh, java.io.printwriter, that's where it is. IO stands for input output. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start uh, writing to it, right? Uh, it's going to complain about it. Here, I'll, let me go ahead and, and surround this with a try catch. Uh, try catch, there we go. All right. Uh, and now I'll go ahead and start writing things to it. Well, guess what? This is why I told you that it was the most convenient way. Because all of the print functions that you have with system.out you also have with a print writer. Uh, if I want to print a line, pr uh, print ln, hello world, right. and that'll put in the inline character for me. Uh, pw.print, uh, how are you doing, right? And then all uh, th that version, I, I, it doesn't insert the inline character for me. So if you want to do it, then you need to put it in manually. Or you have access to printf, right? Uh, percent d percent uh, point four three f. Uh, end the line, and I'll go ahead and uh, give it, I don't know, 105 and uh, 3.14159. There we go. Uh, and after you're done with it, after you've opened it, after you've written to it, what's the third step? You close it. Right? Now, if I run this, let me go ahead and uh, run this. Right? It ran. No output. Why? Well, because we were outputting to a file. Right? There's no output down here. Uh, wait a second, over here in my data folder, you can't see it very well, but where's that file now? My, uh, what did I call it? My output.txt? It should be there, right? It is. One of the quirks of uh, using an IDE is sometimes you have to manually refresh stuff. Uh, and, uh, and, and Eclipse is notorious for this. Many, many other IDEs get this right, and Eclipse still hasn't gotten this right of automatically um, refreshing in the background, probably because of, of efficiency issues. Uh, but let me go ahead and right click this. If you ever see the, the, a file should be there, where is it? It's not there. All you need to do is go down, or uh, F5 uh, is the quick key for it. Once you refresh, oh, there it is. It was there all the time. Right? There's the file, my, uh, uh, myoutput.txt. Uh, there it is. And it, remember, we did point F, uh, uh, point 0.3f. And so I was only printing out pi to three decimal points of accuracy. Uh, but otherwise, that's file output. It's as simple as using a print writer and then cutting and pasting all of your knowledge for system.out. Print ln, print, and printf if you want to use it that way. Okay. Uh, again, the try catch, we'll talk, we'll talk about that shortly here. I'll put this into the notes so that you have it. There we go. All right. So let's see next. Oh, and that's what we'll, we'll be talking about now, error handling. Or handling. There we go. Uh, let's see. Functions. Okay, there we go. All right, so, so it, it's completely different from what you're used to in C. Uh, if you're coming from a Python background, I'm, I think Python has exceptions, but I'm not sure. But uh, it certainly doesn't have what are called checked exceptions. 
Uh, that's unique to Java, unfortunately. Uh, and any, uh, in any case, uh, when something happens, right? When an error happens, you can do one of two things. You can write defensive programming, like you did, we did in C, that you can check, am I about to do something illegal or dangerous or uh, an invalid operation, say like dividing by zero. If I'm about to do something like that, I don't do that. Instead, I, I, I raise an error somehow. Now, if you're designing functions, then you simply return an error code in C. Right? If you have a dynamic programming language like Python or PHP or JavaScript, you can let it be fatal. Right? If, 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 if a division by ha zero happens, then yeah, the program should die uh, and let it die. Right? And then th that's a bug in the program that we need to go back and fix. Uh, but th there is another way of handling stuff, and that's exception handling. Uh, Java supports a lot of different types of exceptions. Uh, let me go ahead and put this up here. There we go. Uh, so what is an exception? An exception is a, an interruption, interruption to the normal flow of control. Right? Uh, need to spell that right. All right. Inter Interruption, OK. Inter, there we go, interruption. So basically, you're going along, you're going along, and something happens, right? It's completely different from defensive programming. Defensive programming, I like to describe as you look before you leap. You're about, uh, you, you check the, den uh, the, the denominator, and is, if it's 0, uh, you don't do x divided by the, uh, y, right, if y is 0. Instead, you do something else. Right? And so that's still normal control flow. You're, you're doing a conditional, and then you're branching out to do something else. Or, oh, it's safe. Go ahead and do what you were going to do. Uh, but, that, it, but error handling is different. Uh, the, the, the defensive programming is kind of looking before you leap. You're, so you walk up to the edge of the cliff, and you look over it. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to survive that fall. I'm not going to leap. I'm going to go and do something else. But exception handling is different. Exception handling is you walk up to the precipice, and you say, OK. Uh, I don't care. I'll go ahead and leap, right? And if it's dangerous, what's going to happen is that the, the exception system is going to catch you before you fall and then throw you back up here and tell you, wait a second, something you, you, le you leapt before you looked. It's okay, I caught you, but now you need to handle that, right? So it's a completely different way of looking at error handling. It's a more modern way of, er of, doing, uh, of doing error handling. C++, C Sharp, most, most programming languages support exception handling. Uh, C supports it in that you can bring in a library to support it, but otherwise uh, C is still defensive programming. Uh, so the way that that works is if uh, a, a dangerous, dangerous piece of code uh, ends up in a th uh, uh, ends up doing something illegal or uh, erroneous, then an exception may be thrown. Right, and I'll, I'll I'll put the keyword like this because the keyword is actually throw, or throws, uh, and so I'll put the n after it. It, it might be thrown, uh, and uh, for some exceptions, these are going to be uh, unchecked exceptions. You have a choice. You can surround the dangerous code with a try try catch block and specify and specify the uh, code that handles handles uh, the error right and that's what we did uh, that, that's kind of what we did over here right uh, let, let me go ahead and uh, come back over here and let's do something uh, potentially dangerous here so int x is equal to 10 int y is equal to ten, uh, 0 uh, int uh, z is equal to x divided by y, uh, and system dot out, uh, print ln. Unfortunately, I, I don't know if division by uh, I don't know if division by zero is going to actually result in this. Let, let's find out. <laughs> All right, let's run this. See what. Oh, okay, good. All right, division by zero. What kind of an exception was thrown? Hopefully, you can read that. Uh, it's an arithmetic exception, right? And where was it thrown? An, an, another good skill to pick up because now we've got uh, exceptions. We've got what are called stack traces. Where did this uh, exception occur? Where did this error occur? Well, it occurred in hello world.java line 32. This is the line that you should be looking at. In fact, it's highlighted so that you can actually click on it and jump to that line in the code. And it says, this is where that exception occurred. And that's obvious because I was dividing by zero. So 
uh, java.lang.arithmetic exception, it saw that you were dividing by zero. Do you see a try catch state of block here? No, because I made the design decision that, all right, well, go ahead and divide by zero if you want to, because if, if you are dividing by zero, that's such a, an error, I want the program to die. And that's what it happened, right? It, it, did you see that the print statement actually execute on line 34? No, because what happened was the exception was thrown all the way up to the main, nobody caught it, nobody handled that exception, and so it killed the entire program. That was a fatal exception, right? I could have instead done something like this. I could surround this with a try, go ahead and try this, right? And I'll, I'll need to declare my, uh, let me go ahead and do it this way so that you can see uh, something. Exception, exception, uh, and what is it? Uh, uh, an, or sorry, an arithmetic exception, AE, right? And then system.out.println, whoa, oh, whoa, uh, whoa, that's bad. All right, there we go. So I've, I'm going to try this potentially dangerous code here, and then if an arithmetic exception occurs, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and handle it here. Uh, maybe instead of, uh, instead of it's, if, oh, you're about to divide by zero, that's just a very, very large number. Maybe then my, uh, my, my, my response to that is to set the, 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 um, uh, the result to a very, very large number. Or maybe to a flag variable that indicates that it's inf, right? One divided by zero, that's infinity because it's so big. Uh, but it, it's up to me now. I, I can, or I can print, it out, print out an error message here and decide not to do anything about it, right? Uh, and it's completely up to me on, what to on how to handle this, and a try-catch is how I end up doing that. Now, there is a, a compiler error here. You probably can't see it, but uh, there is no such thing as Z here. Why does it not know anything about Z on line 38? I declared it on line 35, right? I declared it above there. But where did I declare it? Inside a block, inside curly brackets. And when you declare a variable inside curly brackets in the vast majority of programming languages, its scope is limited to those curly brackets. Just like if you created a, a for loop for int i equals zero, blah, 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 then that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, variable i is only within scope of the for loop. So z doesn't, uh, doesn't exist as far as line 38 is concerned. So what I'll do is I'll come up here and declare it. I have to take away this declaration, and now it's all good. Right? Uh, oops, there's still something wrong. What? Oh, it's not initialized. Right, it's complaining that it's not initialized here. Uh, so I need to initialize the variable, and the default that it chooses to accept is going to be, oh, well, zero is a good initialization. Right? Uh, and so what's going to happen here? I'm still going to divide by zero. So line 34 is going to throw an exception. I will catch it on line 35, print out that error message, and then normal control flow is returned to the rest of the program. It'll end up printing Z, while Z was still going to be zero. So it'll print out the error message and zero. Right? Again, uh, you, could, you could choose to quit. Right? You could choose, say, uh, system.exit with, uh, with an error status. That's how, uh, if you're coming from a C background, remember we exited the program. That's one way that you could handle it instead. This way, I'm just handling it by, OK, well, I'm just going to print an error message and move on. Right? That's your design decision. What do you do? If a file, uh, file input, you expected a CSV file with five tokens on every single line. If you f see that, oh, well, it's an empty file, or there were three tokens, or there were eight tokens, well, how do you handle that? It's completely up to you. You just have to surround it with a try catch. Now, there are other, thing, uh, there are other uh, types of exceptions. There are many types of exceptions. Uh, for example, we are, we've already seen two of them. If I want to open up a file, file f is equal to new file foo.txt, right? And then I want to surround that into a scanner, scanner s is equal to new scanner based on that file. It's going to complain because, well, wait a second, what if that file doesn't exist? If the file doesn't exist, then, I'm going to, then what's going to be thrown is a file not found exception. So this one is bothering me to tr surround it with a try catch block, right? And now that, this will work because, OK, you are catching this. This is, this is, this is the, what's unique to Java. Uh, most programming languages do not have this uh, for very good reason, because it was a very bad idea 20 years ago when they did it. Uh, but they went ahead and w uh, went with it anyway. It's called a checked exception. There are some exceptions 
that uh, in, in Java that require you to surround it with a try catch or otherwise say that it gets thrown up. Uh, there, again, it's a very bad design decision. In fact, if you read the Java documentation on it, it's self-contradictory because I believe that they say, when should you use a checked exception? It's when you, cannot uh, when, uh, when you can reasonably recover from the exception and continue with the program. How do you reasonably recover from a file not existing? Create a random file? <laughs> There's no reasonable recovery from an exception like that. Uh, now, th uh, they're coming at it from the perspective of graphical user interfaces. If you, uh, if you click a file open in a graphical user interface and you f say, OK, I want to open that file right there, right? then yeah, you can reasonably recover from it by uh, advertising to the user with a pop-up, that file doesn't exist. Please select another. But what's the flaw in that design? How do, were you able to select that file to begin with to generate that exception? You weren't. So again, this is something that is unique to Java. C++ does have support for this, but it's optional. Uh, I don't know of any other programming languages besides those two that have thought that this, uh, after 20 years of having this crap, uh, it was a good idea. So uh, unfortunately, it is, a, uh, it is an artifact of 25 years ago. Oh, 25, yeah, 23 years ago. Uh, them thinking, hey, this is a good idea. Uh, and then after 23 years of reflection, no, it's not, because nobody else thought that was a good idea after seeing how it worked. Basically, you're, uh, for some of these things, you're going to have to surround it with a try-catch. The best practice that I would suggest is to throw it back. Right? So uh, we call it catch and release. Right? If you catch a fish and you don't intend to eat it, what do you do? You, you release it. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to re-throw it. Throw new runtime exception e. All this is doing is taking that exception, wrapping it up in a new box called a runtime exception, and then it's throwing it back up. It's catching it and it's releasing it. And this way, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to surround it with a try catch anymore. This try catch is necessary because of the file not found exception. But if I've got a function that calls this function, it, does, it, it can choose to handle it or not, but now it's, it's, it, uh, it, the choice is up to that calling function. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, it's not a, I'm, I'm transferring the burden or I'm transferring the choice and the flexibility up to how, whoever is using this code instead. This will come back to really bite us when we start working with databases because uh, SQL exceptions are everywhere. Anything that you do with the database, with at least with JDBC, you got to surround it with a try-catch exception because uh, it, they, they have these checked exceptions called SQL exceptions. Anything could go wrong with the database. You could lose your connection, or the network connection to the database. You could not have the correct credentials. You could have a bad query. You could have a million different things. But the only way to determine what you did is this one type of exception, SQL exception. Right? Uh, it's not a very well designed or thought out thing that was then eventually you know, corrected in other uh, implementations like uh, uh, JPA and stuff like that, which we won't get into. Don't worry about it. Those are exceptions, right? So when you have, uh, when you, uh, when you have a checked exception that requires you to surround it, surround code with a try catch block, it's best to, best to simply catch and release. Right? And I'm going to go ahead and, and cut and paste the code that we just made so that uh, you have that in your notes. This is what I mean by catch and release. Uh, all you're going to do is simply catch it because you have to have a try catch block, and then you'll release it by throwing a non-checked exception, a runtime exception. Okay. All right. That's basic error handling. Uh, there's a lot more to it. For example, uh, you could also you, you could catch multiple exceptions. You could catch uh, I don't know catch uh, what was the other one Ara arithmetic exception, uh, and I need to call it something else so A E, right? And then I could rethrow that as a runtime or handle handle it some other way. I could say system dot out dot or I could say that Z is now equal to zero instead if I've got an integer int Z, right? equal to one, I'll change it to zero. Or you could catch, uh, the, there, are, there are dozens and dozens of built-in types of exceptions, and you can make your own exceptions if you want. Uh, I won't get into it that deeply, though. Uh, you could catch a null pointer exception. Right? Uh, in this case, it would be if f failed to initialize. If f were null, 
then scanner would say, wait, that's a null. I can't, I can't open a file that, that's null. So I'm going to go, uh, I can catch a null pointer exception, uh, NPE, and rethrow that one, right? Throw new runtime exception, runtime exception, uh, NPE. Yeah? No, it works like an if else if statement. The first one that matches, that's the one that gets executed. So the order matters. And if you've got, if you want to catch all, like if, if, else if, else if, else if, and then finally you want the default else, you can simply just catch exception E. That's the most general type of exception. And if, uh, if, if it throws an exception that doesn't match file not found exception, doesn't match uh, arithmetic exception, doesn't match null pointer exception, it'll definitely match exception. All exceptions are exceptions. Right? So You don't necessarily, uh, if, if you want to do, the, uh, you could have just one generic uh, exception uh, block where, uh, like this catch all down here, right? Yeah. Uh, if, uh, otherwise, you need to look up the hierarchy of inheritance and say, oh, those three I want to handle the same, so what's their, most co what, what's their least common descendant or whatever, right? Or uh, uh, greatest, com uh, greatest common ancestor, or whatever it is, right? Uh, you won't have cause to do that. Again, uh, unless you want really, really fine-grained handling of exceptions and errors, you're, not, uh, you're, you're generally going to take on that catch and release. Or I don't care. If, if an exception happens like divide by zero, or no uh, the wrong password to my database, or I have no network connection, those should be fatal errors. Your program can't reasonably go, uh, move on without that data. So it should be fatal and should die. Right? OK? All right. So. Another important item is, in fact, uh, one of the last uh, topics here is going to be searching and sorting. Right? So you could write your search, uh, own searching and sorting algorithms if you really want to. I would highly recommend against it. Uh, first of all, it's a bunch of busy work. You're reinventing the wheel. Second, uh, you are potentially introducing bugs and, uh, and edge cases and all that kind of stuff. So don't. Right? Use the built-in sorting functionality of any programming language that you have. In particular, in Java, you have uh, built-in uh, uh, searching and sorting algorithms in uh, java.utils.collections. Uh, right? uh, for example, you can, do, you can use collections.sort. Right? Let's go ahead and take a look at what that does. Uh, before I do that, I want some examples here. So uh, let me go ahead and just grab this one. All right. Get rid of this. All right. So what I'm doing here is I've created a list uh, four, seven, three, eight, two, and one. By the way, this is a nice way that you can immediately, uh, if, if you've got just a list of stuff and you want to create a quick list, then arrays. You can take an array and you can convert it to a list, which are different, uh, using arrays dot as list. Right? Uh, but it's a list of integers, and it contains 4, 7, 3, 8, 2, and 1. And if I just print this out, of course, it's going to be unsorted. Uh, a, there we go. Right? It just prints out the list as is. If you want to sort this, all you need to do is go collections dot a, a, and forget this for now. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then let me go ahead and print it out again. Now, what order is it going to be in? Uh, what should be printed here? Looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, and 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, and 8. Right? That's perfectly fine if all you ever want to do is sort integers in ascending order. All right, let's try it out for, I don't know, strings. Let's do this again. So I've got apple, zebra, orange, uh, apples, apple, pineapple, and pie, with the distinction between these being, of course, this is a lowercase a apple and an uppercase a apple. Let me go ahead and uh, I won't print it out first, uh, the first time, but I will sort it and then print it out, b and b. There we go. What's the first thing that's going to print there? Which one of those strings comes first? The, uh, the, this apple right here? The uppercase apple, one of those is going to print first. 
right? Because it, it goes by ASCII values. It doesn't go by a normal dictionary order, in alphabetic order. It goes by ASCII. So all of the capitals will appear before all of the lowercase uh, letters. And if you mix in numbers, the numbers become before letters entirely, and then it's not going to order 120 before 5, right? Or it's not going it, it is going to, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, which is out of order. There, there, I was thinking it was in order, but it's not. 120 comes before 5, not if it's in ascending order. So it's going to be, uh, well, uh, what, what, what's the difference here? Apple versus apples, both uppercase. Which one's going to come first there? Apple. apple, the singular, because S is another letter. So if, uh, if all things are equal except for you know, uh, up, up to a point, then those are going to match. And then nothing is here. Nothing always comes first. Because if you look at the ASCII text table, what's the very first uh, character there? The null, term, the, the null terminating character, the nothing character. So nothing comes before everything else. So if I print this out, I'm going to get apple, apples, and then the rest of it, pie, pineapple, orange, apple, orange, and then zebra. Right? And that's perfectly fine if all you ever want to do is sort strings in lexicographic order according to the ASCII text table. Right? What I want to do, however, is I don't want this order. I want descending order. I want 8, 7, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right? If I'm going to do that, then I need to customize this a little bit. And the way that I'm going to customize this is providing, by providing a different comparator. So if you remember from uh, C, we, how did we sort? We used quick sort, Q sort. Uh, and what, uh, quick sort knows how to order things, right? It says, oh, this is out of order, this, this is out of order. OK, I'll put them in order. But it doesn't know how to order things. When it sees something generic like this, A and B, it doesn't know. Does A come before B, or they're, they're in order, uh, or they're out of order, B comes before A, or they're equal. So it doesn't matter if I put them like this or like this, as long as they're you know, together somewhere in the, uh, in the result. And a comparator is a tool that we use for that. A comparator takes two generic ob objects and says, OK, well, if they go like this, this, or this. And the way that it does it by, is by returning something negative, positive, or zero, depending on the relative ordering of those things. So let me go ahead and write a comparator now. In, in, in C, a comparator would be int, the comparator name, and then const void char, uh, const void star a, const void star b. Right? It's going to be very generic. In other words, it can apply to anything. The way that I'm going to write a comparator here is by creating a, a comparator. Right? Uh, and this comparator, well, the first question is, what, what is this comparator for? What is this comparator comparing? Because in C, you would be comparing void elements, and then you'd have to type set or uh, typecast them to, oh, well, there were students that I wanted to compare, or they were integers that I wanted to compare. This one, I parameterize it. I put that langle wrangle there, less than and greater than, and I say, this is the type of element that should be compared with this comparator, integer. OK? Uh, and I'll, I'll call it descending int compar uh, CMP comparator, right? New comparator for integers. Now, here's some weird new syntax for you. After I take care of the compilation errors, I have to import it. It's still going to complain about it because, come on, import. There we go. It's still going to complain about it because this comparator, is a, it's actually an interface. And we'll talk about interfaces later on. Uh, but basically, it provides one function. That function has to be there. So I'll go ahead and add that function now. That function is compare. If you give me this integer and if you give me that integer, I will return something negative, positive, or zero, depending on the relative ordering of them. So let's go ahead and do that now. Now, we have to think about this. 10, if I want descending, right, the 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, I need to determine, well, wait a second, what if A is greater than B? So if A is greater than B, then that means that A comes first, right? So what should I return? A, B, A comes first because it's greater. So I should return something negative. Right? Else if, oops, sorry. <laughs> They're not called A and B, but we can, we can change that. <laughs> I don't have to call them O1 and O2. I'll call them A and B. That makes more, more sense, at least to me. Uh, and it's less typing. But if A is less than B, that means that, say, I've got 5 and 10. They're out of order. I want 10 and 5. So they're out of order. I return something positive. Right? 
else, oops, return. What's the only other condition? There's, well, they're, they're equal, right? So I'll return 0. Right? That's a comparator that orders them in descending order. Think about it. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's 10 and 5, they're in order. A is greater than B, and so I return something negative. They're in order. Uh, if, a, uh, if, if they're reversed, if A is uh, 5 and B is 10, right, then the second condition takes over, and they're out of order. I need to swap them in my, in, in my sorting algorithm. Otherwise, they're equal, and you can do whatever you want with them. Right? Once I've got this comparator, I can use it to sort in the exact same way that I did before. Instead, I'll call collections. Oops, let's go down. Collections.sort. I'm going to sort that, uh, that list A, and I'm going to, but I'm going to be using my comparator. And then let me go ahead and print it out too. Uh, there we go. Oops. There we go. And when I do this, now they are sorted in descending order instead. I didn't have to write my own sorting or algorithms. I didn't have to rewrite quicksort. Uh, I, I, all I needed to do was say, I don't want that, that, that default ordering of ascending order or lexicographic ordering. I want a different ordering. I want descending order instead. And all I needed to do to, to get that was create a comparator. Not only does that work for integers, I could, I could uh, write my own comparator for strings. I could write my own comparator for user-defined objects like, say, a student class or what we are eventually going to do is an airport class. Uh, because we did that last semester, all right. That's how you search. Uh, that's how you sort, right? You just need to create a comparator. Uh, by the way, this is uh, this is called an, an an anonymous class instantiation, or it's basically an anonymous class. Uh, what what is the name of this thing? Well, that's the name of the variable, right? Desk int cmp. But what is the name of this class? Well, comparator is kind of its name, but that, it's not its name. It's it's, it's actually its interface. And that's something that we'll get into later on when we get into inheritance. This is actually an anonymous class. I didn't, I didn't put this into its own .java file, did I? Uh, that's because it's just an anonymous class. It's, it's a one-use class. right? There's no reason for me to put this into the, another uh, .java file, because I'm not going to be making two or three or four or 10 of these things. I'm only going to be making one. And I'm going to only pass it off to so the, my sorting algorithm so it can sort. So if I, do, uh, I don't need a, an entire class to do this, I can use a small inline uh, anonymous class declaration like this. All right, All right. questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, that was automatically generated. It's not, uh, it, you can get rid of, it, rid of it if you want, but then you're gonna get this annoying, uh, oh, no, you're not. Sometimes you get this annoying warning that uh, you should have that annotation there. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, just leave it. Uh, that's uh, th those are called annotations. That's something that we're not going to get into in this course because annotations are aspect-oriented programming, uh, not object-oriented programming. So uh, it's basically the, the, you you are giving aspects to your code, and the 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 primary use case of that in Java is so that you can inject boilerplate c code. Uh, so, for example, if you if you take a look at the JPA video later on, this is how JPA does it. Basically, you say here's my class. It corresponds to that table over there. Now you can choose to write several hundred lines of JDBC code that, that, uh, that, that makes a query to that database, pulls stuff out, and then populates your, your class with, say, the first name and the last name and the uh, NUID, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could just put a, in a bunch of annotations that say, well, this variable corresponds to that, that column in that table. And then by just putting that one aspect in there, it, it takes care of everything else for you. Uh, it's really nice and convenient, uh, but it's aspect-oriented programming, which is a completely different paradigm. Right. All right. Good question. Uh, another question? Or? No? OK. Well, that's searching. Uh, that's searching. What about sort? Uh, oh, sorry, that's sorting. What about searching? So collections dot. Well, you can't see it down there, but guess what else is in there? What's the best way to search? What's the most efficient way to search? If something is already in order, what, what kind of uh, algorithm can you use? B, uh, B search, that's the B stands for? Binary search. Well, we're not, uh, we're not in C anymore, so we don't have to save on characters like C does with B search. Uh, instead, it's binary search, right? You're, you can afford to spell it all out, right? Uh, and here's the list. Say the list is going to be A. And what's my key? I want to search for, I don't know. 10. 
That's going to be an unsuccessful search because it's there is no 10 in there, right? Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, what, what does it return? I think it returns the index. Can't see it, but uh, I'll read it to you. It returns the index of the search key. So let's go ahead and capture that. Int x is equal to, uh, do I ever, nope, I don't already have x. So system.out.println uh, found uh, k, uh, let's say k at index, and then I'll just go ahead and concatenate there. Uh, let me go ahead and put that in this, uh, into a variable int k is equal to 10. There we go. And so if we're, we're going to do a couple searches here, I just want to have to change one value. So found k, we're not going to find it though, right? What do you think it returns for an unsuccessful search? Negative one. Ah, OK. That makes sense. Well, actually, it's, it's going to return something negative. Uh, what it returns, uh, you have to read the documentation to find out. Uh, but it returns something negative, which is never a, uh, a valid uh, index value. But it also gives you the magnitude of it, also gives you additional information. That I believe that if you were to make it into a positive, that's the index at which it belongs if it were there. Right. So it gives you even more information. Uh, let me go ahead and search for, I don't know, uh, five. What was in there? Uh, five's not in there. Uh, let's search for four. I'm uh, let's search. What's the maximum? Uh, uh, eight. Let's search for eight. Let's run this. Let's oh, sorry. Thank you. All right. Wait. Found eight at index negative seven. It was there. It's right there. What's wrong? So what does binary search require? Binary search requires that the array be sorted sorted in the same order in which it searches. So what it's doing right here is it's looking at the center and it's saying, oh, it doesn't exist. But uh, eight, eight is going to be larger than whatever the center was. The center was, uh, well, say three. Eight is larger than three. So where is it going to go? It's going to go that direction. Eight is that direction. This is because the default searching pattern is going to be a, an assumption that you've uh, sorted in ascending order. And that's, what I ha that, that's not what I've done, right? I sorted on line 55 here in descending order. So one solution will be to, well, you have to use the same sorting algorithm. So I'll go ahead and resort it in ascending order, the default sorting me uh, mechanism, and hit it there. Now it finds it at, uh, at index 5. I've not printed it out. Maybe I should print it out one more time and show you. Sort it, print it, then search it. And indeed, it is at index 5. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's 8. It did find it down. Because your, the way that you were searching was consistent with the way that it was sorted. Uh, an alternative, if you want to do it in the, uh, in the opposite direction, that's perfectly fine too. I'll go ahead and sort it using my comparator, desk int cmp, uh, print it out. But instead of using binary search like this, I need to provide that same comparator, desk int cmp. There we go. And now both of these uh, s uh, searches will be successful. I can't have two x's, though. So let me go ahead and x found at index 5. And then when it was sorted in des descending order, it was found at index 0. So remember, you have to be consistent with your searching and sorting patterns. They, uh, you, can't, you can't order it in ascending order and then search it in descending order. Right? You have to, uh, they have to be the same. Uh, there is linear search. Uh, but the, the, those, are, those are usually built into the classes themselves. So for example, a dot contains 10, right? That returns a Boolean. Uh, flag is equal to this. And then you can system.out.println flag. There we go. And it does not contain 10, so it's going to return false. Uh, otherwise, you can check, does it contain uh, 4? I think it contained 4, didn't it? Yep, that's true. That's just a, a straight up linear search telling you, yes, it exists. No, it does not exist. Otherwise, you can do something like um, int index is equal to a dot index of 8, right? Or let's do it, go 4. Right? And then you can print that out. So lots of ways of doing searching and sorting without really having to write any of your own searching and sorting code. It works. Right? If it were a different type, like a user-defined type, then you would have to create a comparator that says, oh, this student's NUID and this student's NUID are the same. And I'll show you how to do that when we start looking at uh, uh, actual classes. 
Yeah. Oh, it's way faster. Uh, it's logarithmic. Uh, it's exponentially faster. Uh, binary search is going to be order log n. Well, we haven't talked about orders, but in 235, you'll start talking about it. And later in the semester, we'll, we'll, we'll formalize that a little bit. Uh, but it only takes log base 2 of n uh, comparisons to, uh, to search uh, an array. Uh, and if you use linear search, and you, uh, well, you can use it no, uh, regardless of what the order that it's in, but it means that you're starting at the beginning. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? Right? So if you imagine that you have, say, a trillion records, well, you might, uh, might end up for an unsuccessful search making a trillion comparisons until you get to the end. But if you sort it, and they, or if it already is sorted for free, hopefully, uh, because that's how you should maintain data. Uh, if it's already sorted and you do binary search, it's only going to take log of 1 trillion, which uh, I don't have a browser open here, but I can. We'll just go to Wolfram Alpha. All right. Log base 2 of 1 trillion, billion, million, thousand, tens. There we go. So how many comparisons are you going to end up making using just binary search? 40 something, right? At most 40. 40 versus 1 trillion. There's no contest there. It's exponentially faster. So uh, the, the amount of data that you'll be processing in this course, though, will probably not reach the level where it matters. Uh, last semester, when the, your, your last um, uh, project, did, it did matter. That was artificial data, but I ensured that it was big enough that if you did stuff naively, uh, that it was not computationally feasible at all. Oh, now we're not talking like millions of years, but we're talking hours, maybe even, maybe even a day of computation time versus using binary search right, uh, uh, to, find, uh, to find duplicates or whatever. Uh, immediate, right? Just a, 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 just a few milliseconds to, to complete it. All right. All right. Any questions so far? No? All right. Well, then let me go ahead and cut and paste all of this for the notes. There we go. Now they're all there. Uh, and then the last part is going to be kind of a segue into uh, the next topic, which is going to be classes. All right. So Java is an object-oriented programming language. Now, what that means is that it emphasizes objects and the interaction of objects over, say, C. C is a procedural language or a structural language where it emphasizes procedure, right? That you do A, then B, then C. Oh, you need to do something more substantial? OK, call that function over there. Uh, passing in parameters or maybe, uh, maybe pass by value. Uh, that's something we didn't talk about, but don't worry. It, Java is only passed by value because there are no pointers. Uh, so there's no way for you to do uh, pass by reference. Uh, but uh, C is very, very procedural. This, then this, then this, and call that function over there. That process, that control flow, that that's what determines how a program uh, mutates its state until it gets its output and its result. Uh, Object-oriented programming is a little bit different in that uh, the emphasis is on objects. Uh, we'll start at the bottom here and, okay, we'll, we want to model a student or we want to model uh, an airport or we want to model something, right? Uh, and then we'll go ahead and, uh, and come up with that model and to it. Okay, well, I've got an airport and another airport and I want, I want to uh, determine, well, what's the distance, the air distance between them? So that's behavior. I'm going to put that behavior in where it belongs, inside that object. In C, uh, if you remember, uh, you, uh, I did have you design a, an airport structure, but it didn't have any behavior. It had, say, a name, a latitude, a longitude. Right? That's just data. That's not behavior. How did you end up computing the air distance between these two things? You wrote a function. And that function existed outside of those structures. You've got a structure airport 1 and a structure airport 2. To compute the distance between them, you had to have a third thing over here called a function. And so you gave them to that function, and it gave you the result. What's fundamentally different about a class, however, is that all that functionality is inside the class. 
So you're no longer uh, going to this third thing over here, this, function, this external function to determine uh, the relationship between these two objects. Instead, you're having these objects interact with each other to give you a result. Now with that in mind, I do want to show you the starting basics of this. Right? Um, for now, let's go ahead and, well, let, let's go ahead and, and model an airport. Right? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go over here, source, uh, in my, pa uh, in my uh, unl.csc package. I'm going to create a new class. Right? Now, what's an appropriate name for this thing? What, what do you, how do you label stuff? Uh, uh, this is a, uh, an unlabeled can of, of peas. OK, I'll, I'll label it as corn. No. You put labels of what's, what's inside. So what's my label for this? Airport. Right? So design tip number one, Classes, class names are always uh, upper camel cased. Right? Uh, that's, the, that, that, that's just standard Java. If you ever do anything other than that, it, it's going to look really weird. Uh, now, naming rules is to say that, well, you can use whatever names you want as long as there are no spaces. You can't begin with a, a number. You can use any combination of uppercase, lowercase letters. But the convention is going to be upper camel casing. That's why I had an uppercase A, right? Airport. Now, as it is, there's nothing here, right? There's nothing here that defines an airport. Uh, so that's the first step. The first step is we need to define what an airport is. I'm not going to start writing code like int main, whatever, 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 or uh, another function. That, that's behavior. Functions, methods, that's behavior. That's action. What I want is data. I want the nouns instead of the verbs. What defines an airport? Name? OK. Now, what type is a name? A string. So now an airport has a string that's called name. All any instance of an airport that I create, uh, LNK, uh, Lincoln uh, Municipal Airport, OMA, which is uh, Epley Airfield, or, I think, uh, or Epley Airport or whatever, right? Those those are the names, right? But I designated them as LNK and OMA. That's another thing that defines an airport, right? A three-letter code designating the airport. Does anybody know what that's called? Because I don't. Is <laughs> what? A code? Designation? I have no idea. Uh, so I, I think that they're call maybe called abbreviations. Uh, so what is that? Uh, I'll, I'll call it an abbreviation or a, a code. right? But what type is that? Well, if it's a collection of letters, then it's also a string. OK. Uh, let's keep it simple. Uh, I do want latitude and longitude. So latitude, longitude, right? And by the way, sh again, you're not, uh, you're not being paid by the, uh, the characters, or you're, you're not paying by the characters, so there's no reason to shorten things up. If you want to name these lat and lawn, or well, you can't name it long, why? That's a, that, that's a key word in the, uh, in the language. You could name it lat and long, but uh, uh, those those abbreviations are icky, right? You're not paying by the you're not paying by the character. You might as well use the full thing. Longitude, right? Latitude. There we go. Now, what are those? Okay, doubles. You could say that they're floats because uh, um, latitude longitude is only between zero and 180, and so you really only need about eight decimals of accuracy to pinpoint latitude and longitude down to a meter or so. Uh, and most GPSs are only accurate to within uh, like a few meters or something. Uh, now, military grade ones will probably be at more accurate to within a few centimeters or something like that, but you don't have access to those. Right? I, I believe that it's still the case that you know the commercial GPSs, in fact, the GPS system introduces a level of error uh, in the uh, for commercial systems, doesn't it? So that you can't have super accurate smart bones. But I don't I don't understand the difference between hitting a bomb over here and hitting it two meters away because as long as it blows up, it's still going to work, right? So I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, we've got latitude and longitude. Okay. Now, how do I create this? Let, let me go ahead and create uh, create another class here that shows a demonstration. Airport demo. Uh, and again, you can go back to that, uh, that assignment if you really want to. And uh, I think that we also had like a, an address or something like that, maybe, 
Uh, but th this is good enough for now. Yeah? It's because it's not it, uh, it, when it's when it uh, when it's colored magenta like this. Uh, those are the built-in primitive types. The eight primitive types: int, double, float, long, long, uh, boolean, char, byte, and I'm missing one. What is it? Yeah. Oh, oh, are there only seven? I thought there were. Eight. Oh, I thought there were nine, and then uh, there were eight. Yeah. Uh, whatever it is. Anyway, those are primitive types. Basically, those are not objects. So I say in Java, everything is an object or belongs to an object. In a pure, programming, a pure object oriented programming language, everything would be an object. But Java is not a pure programming language because it has these seven or eight primitive types, where there, it's, it's just a, a regular old variable that you can assign to it. It's not a reference to this object over here that has multiple state and, and behavior uh, uh, potentially. Uh, so that's why they're, they're highlighted like this. A string, on the other hand, that is a class. It's in java.lang.string. They, they, they built that class to represent strings. They built it into the language, and it's part of the standard library. String dot, exactly. Str oh, well, string dot or named, uh, like later on, you can go name dot to, upper, uh, to uppercase. Right? You can do stuff like that. They, uh, but you can't do anything with the, with these because they're they're just they're just values. It's just a six it's just sixty four bit number, uh, like latitude is. It doesn't have behavior to it. It doesn't have methods uh, attached to it. Now you could go with the wrapper classes instead, the big D doubles or the big I integers or the big L longs, and now those are classes. Uh, but the only time that you should use those directly is when you need tri valued logic. In other words. There's a value or there's not a value. If you need a null value, a nullable value, then you have to use these. Uh, the only other time that you use them is in collections, but then that's automatic. Right? If you're actually going to declare a number, use the primitive types. All right. All right, there it is. So let's go ahead and create the Lincoln Airport. Create an airport for Lincoln. Or Lincoln. There we go. I was thinking LNK, which is its abbreviation, right? Or its code. How do I create a new airport? Well, uh, airport right? Lincoln right? is equal to ooh, what? It's not like a regular variable. Int x is equal to 10. Right? That, uh, that assignment operator, that's a built-in primitive type. Java knows how to deal with that. Oh, 10, 1, 0. I know how to convert that to binary and then store it into a memory location so it can be interpreted as an integer. But airport? Airport is a user-defined type. Java doesn't know how to create that. You have to specify how to create that. And the way that you do that, uh, by default, it g does give you a, a default way of doing this. Like we've been doing implicitly all the way up to this point, if we want something new, new airport. Right? And now I've got the Lincoln Airport. OK. Did I tell it that it was called the Lincoln Municipal Airport and that it was at latitude whatever, whatever, whatever? No. So it doesn't know that stuff yet, does it? And we can, that becomes uh, readily apparent when we try to print it out. It doesn't even know how to print this out. Uh, system, oh, what's wrong? System dot, oh, you know what? Duh. I need a main. Uh, public static void main string args. There we go. Bring this stuff in there. There we go. Now it's happy with it. Let's go ahead and try to print it out. It's going to print out what seems like garbage. UNL CSE Airport. Well, it knows its type and it knows its package. At and then this hexadecimal number. Again, that hexadecimal number is the Java virtual machine address at which it's stored. It doesn't know that it's a Lincoln Airport and it, and it doesn't know to print out Lincoln instead because we never told it how to do that stuff. In fact, well, I'm going to go ahead and give you a, uh, a refresher here. Remember, if you click over here and this little blue dot appears, I'm setting a breakpoint. I want to see what, well, it, it does have these things. It has a name, it has a code, it has a latitude and a longitude. It's just that I can't see them. If I run the debugger, I can see what they are. Let's go ahead and run it. And over here, uh, OK, I'll go ahead and go to the next line. Now it's initialized. Before it gets printed, here's Lincoln up here. And unfortunately, it's, it's pretty small. But yeah, I'll go ahead and scroll through it. The code is null. The latitude is 0. 
the longitude is zero, and the name is null. Those are the default values that Java assigns for you if you don't provide them, right? Uh, I didn't say that it, here, here's the name and here's the latitude and the longitude and said it, all it could say is, okay, I'll go ahead and go with the defaults. For objects, that's going to be null. For number types, that's always going to be zero. Zero for integers, 0, 0.0 for floating point numbers. For, uh, uh, for Boolean types, that's always going to be false. Again, it's influenced by C. Zero is false, right? Uh, so that's why it assigns a, uh, a, a value of false by default. Well, I don't like that. I want to be able to play around with this stuff. And by the way, remember, you could hit the, bu uh, the bug up here to go into debug mode, and then you can step through. I'll go ahead and step through, and then it, it, now, now the, the program hasn't ended yet, but if I step one more step, then it'll end, right? And then I can go back to my Java perspective over here. Well, I actually want that stuff to have values. I want Lincoln's name to be Lincoln Municipal Airport. Is that the official name? Anybody know? Uh, it is? OK. And then Lincoln.code is equal to LN, I believe it's LNK. Right? That's why we've got the OMA link. Right? Uh, and Lincoln. Latitude is equal to, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> what, uh, I have no idea what it's going to be. So uh, LNK, uh, latitude, longitude, Google will tell me, I'm sure. There we go. So I'm going to have to translate that. Uh, that's 40 degrees north. All right, that, wor that will work. Lincoln dot longitude. Now, that's west, 97 degrees west, which means that if you look at a Mercator map, that's going to be negative 90, 96 degrees. Right. There we go. Now, when I run this, it now has values. It's still not going to print correctly. It's still going to print this mysterious uh, 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 memory address. In fact, if you rerun it, it's going to be, uh, oh, oh, no, it's always loaded it up in the same memory address. Uh, that's because it's always loaded up in the Java virtual machine. Uh, but if I run the debugger, and I go step by step here, you will see that it actually gets updated. Right? Uh, that's, that's its code. This is its name, Lincoln Municipal Airport. You see it on the uh, right side there. If I go with one more step, then you see that the code was updated. And in fact, it highlighted it in, in yellow up there. That gives you a visual cue that something changed. And if I go up here and look at it, it's an LNK. If I go one more step, then the latitude is going to be highlighted because it's been changed, and it now has a value. Uh, the values are actually over here as well. It's just easier to see them down here. When you, when you highlight them, basically, it's printing them out to the standard output for you. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and continue, and, uh, and, and you see that it actually changed. Now, this, this should look very familiar. How did I access those member variables? with the dot operator, right? And where, where, where have you seen that before? C. Uh, and that's because of C that, that, that it's this way. Uh, dot is the ac uh, accessor uh, uh, operator. Uh, it accesses things inside uh, the class, OK? And we've been using it all over the place, right? System dot out. Well, system is a class. Out is a variable inside that class that you can access. Then uh, a system.out.println, that is a function, of a method, inside this object right here, which is inside the class. So you've been using this implicitly all the way up till this point. Right? Well, that looks OK. But again, with, stru with structures, what was the bad thing about structures? Or the, the, uh, if I want to do Omaha now, OK, I got to do one, two, three, four, cut and paste four lines of code, do it over and over and over again. right? What you're actually invoking up here is called a constructor. A constructor is a function that specifies how you construct a new object. By default, it's giving it all those default values, null, zero, false, right? Well, I don't want those default values. I want my own constructor. Constructors begin with, well, the, uh, with a keyword public here. Uh, you can make them private, but then that means that nobody can call it. Uh, so it's kind of a useless constructor, unless you follow some design pattern like, the, uh, like a singleton pattern. Or you have a, uh, if you have a very good reason to make it private, then yeah, go ahead and go with that design. But for now, we'll make everything public. And it has the same name, 
airport, uh, airport as the class. That's a function. Wait a second. That's different from all the other functions that we've looked at so far. One, it doesn't have the static keyword. And that's because the function now belongs to the instances of the class instead. Two, there's no return type. It's a constructor. If you're constructing an airport, you don't need a return type because, well, you're constructing an airport. I know what an airport is. I know that the class is called airport. There's no return type there. Right? But inside this, you can initialize anything that you want. Uh, let's say that I want to pass in the name, string name. Name is equal to name. Right? If I wanted to pass in the code as well, code, uh, string code, code is equal to code. Now, there is a problem here. If you see it, uh, hold off, no spoilers. Uh, and let's go over here. Oh, there are a couple of problems. First of all, now this is a compiler error. Right? It's kind of like a lawyer. If you do not provide, if you do not provide a, a constructor, a default one will be provided for you. Right? If you cannot afford a lawyer, then one will be provided for you. But the second that you provide one, now your free lawyer goes away, right? You've hired another lawyer, and or you've created another constructor, and you no longer need to, uh, and, and you no longer have access to this default constructor provided by the language. Instead, I will pass in Lincoln Municipal Airport and LNK, and then I, I don't need to do these things anymore. Let's run it and see what it looks like. Again, it doesn't know how to print, but I can look through the debugger here and see that okay. After I create it, let's look at everything that's been initialized. Uh, OK, uh, yeah, no, this is the second pro problem that I wanted to raise. It's still null, 0, 0, and null. What went wrong here? So let's go ahead and stop it. There are two names. Let's just focus on name for a second. There are actually two names here. Actually, there, there are three names. Can you see them all? Uh, there's one declared on line 5, there's one in the parameters on line 10, and then there are two references to it. So there's, there's actually only two names here. Uh, but there are two variables with the same name with different scopes. Line 5 is different from line 10. Line 10 is a parameter variable. Line 5, that's a class variable. So I've got two variables with the same name. On line 11, what I'm doing is I'm assigning that parameter is equal to the parameter. What I want to do is I want to take the parameter and assign it to, I want to take the thing on line 10 and assign it to the thing on line 5, to the class va variable. But that's not happening. What's happening is, and it's, it's warning me about it. If you can see this, it's uh, uh, in a uh, highlight, code highlighted in a, in a warning with, with, with the uh, uh, yellow line here. That has no effect. That's like doing something like this, int x x is equal to x. Right? How useful is line 12? It's not useful at all. Right? I mean, it does something. It just takes the value in x and then puts it back into x. That's what we're doing on line 13. We're taking this variable and assigning it to itself. And it's warning me about that. That's not what you want. I want to take this variable's value and store it into this variable up here. To do that, I need to distinguish these two things. This one uh, on the right-hand side is perfectly fine. But the thing on the left-hand side, I need to say that I want this variable instead of this variable. The way that I do that is the keyword this dot. Right? Why is it called this? Well, I'm inside the class, right? I know the class name, but I don't know the instance name. There's a Lincoln Airport, right? Do you see the word Lincoln in here? No. That's outside the class. Right? Outside the class, I called my airport variable Lincoln. But inside the class, it has no awareness of that. It doesn't know what I, it, it, it's an object. It doesn't know what it's called. The, uh, the, the, the variable name Lincoln is an outside reference to me. And now I'm taking on the role of the object here. Uh, that's an outside reference to me. I don't know what they're calling me. So what do I call myself? Well, if I'm a person, I personify myself, and I call myself me. I, right, myself. But if I'm an object, I, I don't have that kind of identity, unfortunately. I'm just uh, an inanimate object. What do I call myself? This, right? There are some programming languages that do use the keyword me. Uh, Visual Basic, I think, does that. So they like to treat their objects as people, apparently. Uh, there are other ways that you can do this. Self is another keyword that's used in some languages to distinguish 
that. But I need a way to talk about myself when I don't know what my name is. So I use this generic this, me, right, basically, but as an object. And now this should work, this dot. And when I run the debugger and run past that, uh, run past that, oh, I did, oh, I need to get in my perspective here. There we go. Now, it, now it's been created. Look at that. Now the code is LNK and the name is Lincoln.